name is uh, Jessica Bellworthy. Uh, I am currently a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Haifa, which is in the north of Israel. Uh, but I'm based in the south of Israel, in Eilat. Um, there's a marine institute there, uh, which I'll talk a little bit more about um, later. Uh, I'm a marine biologist. I did my degree in Swansea University in marine biology and a master's at the University of Southampton. And for my PhD, I've moved uh, to Israel and I've been here in Eilat for about six years now. Um, so I want to take you on a little journey through a little bit of coral biology, uh, also a little bit of the research that I'm doing now, bits of climate change, and also uh, because you guys are my audience, I'm definitely going to show lots of pictures of diving and uh, talk a little bit about how diving plays a really important role um, in being able to do the kind of research that we do. Um, so a little bit of background on me, just so you can understand a bit about where I'm coming from. This is me. Um, I grew up in a family uh, with two parents who are also uh, scuba divers. My dad is a, a BSAC instructor. And that meant that uh, we were really fortunate as kids to spend a lot of time uh, close to the sea. Like this was my parents' passion, so it also um, quickly became mine. And we would get a really nice uh, tropical holiday, usually once a year, something like Egypt or the Maldives, super lucky. And also we spent um, the school summer holidays typically in Brittany, in France. So also we would spend hours or full days digging in, in rock pools and catching gobies on lines and also picking uh, the crabs um, and also um, picking under the algae to see what sorts of critters that we can find there. And the photo in the in the bottom in the middle is my uh, first open water dive, um, which despite the fact that I had these, actually, I don't know if my parents remember, I have these huge sunburned blisters on my shoulders and the BCD was rubbing and I didn't manage to equalize my ears properly because I was just super excited. So I got like a bloody nose in the mask in the dive. Uh, but I didn't really care. I still thought it was super cool. And this is definitely what I'm going to be doing. Um, currently, I still have a really big passion for diving, but I use slightly more sophisticated equipment, let's say. Um, during my PhD uh, and now my postdoc in Israel became an open circuit uh, technical trimix diver, but also more recently um, closed system trimix diving. Uh, I did a lot of research uh, in aquarium systems throughout my PhD, um, but also the really cool thing about being a marine biologist, or the, the nice excuse uh, for being a marine biologist, is that I also get to travel a bit, and the two photos on, on the side on the boat, this is in Lizard Island um, in the northern Great Barrier Reef. Um, so I love science, I love marine biology, um, and I love investigating things in the sea. But if I'm really honest, like the, the passion really is diving. Um, and I guess in some ways the science of the marine biology is kind of an excuse to go diving. So I'm really lucky in that way that my job allows me to, to dive a lot. There's also a lot of time, you know, behind the computer and data analysis and months of days and weeks of that. But at the end of it, I know that I can probably jump in the sea uh, at the end of the day. So I'm now based um, in Eilat. As we said, this is a, an institute where I work uh, called the Inter-University Institute. And I think you can see my pointer, this top picture here. This is the institute and these are our, our offices. Uh, this is a diving center. Um, we specialize in sort of deep or technical diving. Um, and the really nice thing about this institute is that we have a, a fringing coral reef that actually goes pretty much all the way around the Red Sea. Um, and that's a shallow reef. So we have this really nice shallow reef environment. But very, very quickly, we have a drop off um, that let's say probably something like around here, if this picture would continue. We're already getting to like 30, um, 40 meters deep. So that gives us fantastic access to deep reefs as well. Um, and just as I should have said, um, if you need a little help with the location, 
This map here, we have the Mediterranean Sea. This uh, blue section, we have Egypt here. Uh, this is Sharm el-Sheikh, if you've ever been lucky enough to go there, and the Tehran Straits. Israel is this long, thin country that is uh, here in between Egypt, or the Sinai Peninsula, and Jordan. And this already here is Saudi. So from my office, or let's say from this beach in the picture, I can see four countries. Um, Israel just has a tiny portion of, of land uh, on the Gulf of Aqaba. So I'm going to talk to you today a lot about coral biology and coral reefs a bit more generally, um, but my speciality very definitely is corals. Um, so in order to get us all on the same page, I want to start with defining what exactly is a coral. And um, I guess many of you are able to pick out from this photograph um, all sorts of different types of corals. Let's say, look, here we have this kind of tab table-like coral. We have also here, this is a coral, which is more of a, a mounding sort of encrusting shape. Um, this bobbly thing in the middle actually is also a soft, uh, sorry, is a hard coral. Um, and then we have these corals at the top here. This is actually a hydrozoa, which is a, a fire coral. And if any of you have ever touched a fire coral uh, by accident, you will know why it has its name. Um, we also have in this picture uh, some soft corals, that's this section here, which are related to the hard corals that build the reef, but uh, these soft corals don't actually have that hard reef building skeleton. So that's like a big picture view of uh, lots of different kinds of corals. This is a Red Sea picture, very, very diverse, a lot of endemic species uh, in the Red Sea, also fish, which means that we don't get those species anywhere else in the world, only in the Red Sea. But in order to really understand what is going on here, I wanna zoom into the picture a little bit more. And this is a, a microscope image. Um, you can see by the scale bar, the scale bar at the top is about half a millimeter. So this one, um, this one section here in the middle, this is one, coral polyp or one coral animal that is something like one millimeter long. Um, so this is the coral. The coral itself is an animal. Um, and you see uh, this structure here, there's this white or uh, transparent tissue. This is the coral animal itself. It has a mouth in the middle here. And it's, the mouth is surrounded by a ring of tentacles. It's kind of like an, an upside down jellyfish, exactly the same um, body morphology pretty much. And actually they are very closely related to jellyfish. But what's really key to the coral uh, ability to succeed and to grow is this partnership that it has with unicellular algae. So single celled algae and algae are plants. And that is all of these brown coloration that you can see, which lives inside the coral tissue. Um, so all of this brown color, that's because of the, the algae. You can perhaps see even individual cells, these individual brown dots um, just here in the tissue. And what these algae do is because they are plants, they have the ability to do photosynthesis. So just like the trees and the grass and the flowers in your garden, they take the energy from the sun, the light energy, and they are able to convert that into a chemical energy or essentially sugar. And this sugar, uh, they very generously pass it on to the coral animal. And the coral animal can get anywhere between 70 to 100% of its energy in this way. So to say that in another way, essentially the coral doesn't, often do a lot of effort in feeding itself. It is the relationship that it has with these algae living inside its tissues that enable the coral to feed. And that's where it gets most of its energy from. Um, so different kinds of environments, different kinds of corals will have slight variations on how important this relationship is to them. But essentially this symbiosis, which means that they are both, and both partners benefit from this relationship, are really the foundation of coral reefs. 
So a lot of my work that I do is to do with coral reproduction um, and how um, the larvae survive and how they grow in their first early, like first few weeks of life, let's say. This is really like my key focus. <clears throat> so I want to take a moment to take a walk through the coral life cycle and explain to you uh, how that goes, because I think it's pretty cool. It's not so simple as you might think. Um, so taking a look, first of all, at this video in the bottom, this is coral spawning. Maybe some of you have seen it before. It's this kind of upside down snow type, uh, type look. So you have the coral at the bottom there, and you see all these floaty pink dots um, that are rising up to the surface of the water. And what is inside these little pink bundles, we call them, is a combination of sperm and eggs for most species. Um, and what happens is on particular nights of the year, you might have heard of the mass spawning uh, on the Great Barrier Reef. So for the Great Barrier Reef, it's usually only one or two nights of the year. So all the corals release all their sperm and eggs into the water column. This is spawning. And as they get to the surface of the water column, there's waves and wind. And so those bundles break apart, releasing all the sperm and eggs freely into the water and also into your ears and snorkel and mouth and regulator if you happen to be in the water there. Um, and what happens uh, after this release of sperm and eggs, water goes all cloudy and you uh, eventually hopefully get some fertilization going on. So that means a sperm contacting the egg the eggs uh, starts to develop uh, into an embryo and eventually, perhaps after something like five days for most species, you should get a coral larvae. Uh, so this is also what I call coral babies. I might also use the term planuli or coral planuli. This is just the specific name given to a coral baby. Um, you also have species which kind of skip this external fertilization stage, and instead they do fertilization inside the coral uh, adult, and then they release uh, larvae straight away. And you can see these larvae are something like two millimeters long uh, in this species that I work with most commonly. <clears throat> and most of the larvae look like this. The difference between these two larvae, I will touch back on um, towards the end of the talk um, and why these two larvae look quite different from each other. But nature sometimes also makes mistakes. So in this picture, you have, for example, this guy, which is kind of rounded and bumpy and just didn't get the right idea at all. And you also have a few individuals in this picture that actually have two heads. So two mouths, also here, this guy, I collected them all together. They didn't all come out like that. I did have one uh, master's student who looked at whether these uh, mistakes can go on to develop normally or not, or whether they die. Um, this was a project that I did in Australia because I saw really high numbers uh, of these mistakes compared to what I see normally in a lat. Um, so I am yet to, to get to the results of, of these, these papers to be published. But what she found essentially is that whilst many of them do die, there are a small percentage of them, the ones that have two mouths rather than two butts, can already start, start to develop um, completely normally, which is, I think is really cool. So after these larvae stage, which you can essentially think of as like a little worm, and that's drifting around in the sea, these tiny little larvae, like all larvae in the sea, need to eventually find their way back to the reef. We don't really know how they manage to do it. There are some ideas, but uh, we're not really sure. And then eventually, once they find the reef, they kind of crawl along like a little caterpillar. You can see this kind of body motion. This is definitely a, a sped up video, video sorry, by the way. Um, they crawl along the surface. And now comes a really, really vital stage uh, of their life cycle. Um, and that's because once a coral settles in one place, it can't just pick itself up and move again. If the conditions change or um, if it uh, gets too warm, for example, or 
doesn't like its neighbors anymore. Somebody bigger and faster and stronger settles next to him. He can't pick up its bags and move. This coral is choosing its place for to live for its entire life at just a few days old. So kind of like this little guy looks like he's just about doing now. He's kind of stuck in one place and starting to think, okay, this is good for me. This might be my home. And the stage that comes next is this amazing transformation from this larvae shape into the first coral polyp, that first animal structure that we showed uh, right in the beginning. So it transforms from a larvae to this perfect polyp with tentacles and starts to also lay down its skeleton and starts to build the reef. What happens next over a period of years is that this one coral polyp will asexually divide, which means it makes um, exact copies of itself and buds and grows and grows and grows and grows until the coral is getting bigger. So if we're looking at this photograph. This is uh, somebody's finger, not mine. Um, and each one of these little bubbles on the coral will be one coral polyp. So this coral is just starting to grow. It's still very, very tiny, uh, but it is growing up. And this continues over a period of years until eventually that coral itself is big enough to produce its own babies or to go through reproduction. So in this photograph, what you are looking at is a broken fragment, a uh, broken branch of a coral. And we're looking inside its skeleton and a little bit of tissue that is inside the skeleton and all the pink dots. So here where the, the arrows are pointing, these are these egg sperm bundles ready to be released probably that day. Um, uh, and there you complete the full life cycle. Okay, so corals are beautiful and diverse, but why do we care about them? From uh, originally my point of view as a child, uh, and maybe for many of you as well, we love to visit coral reefs when we have a chance to have a holiday. Um, and tourism is a huge revenue for uh, many countries that host coral reefs. Um, take the example of Egypt, for example, one of their main incomes is tourism, not only from the pyramids, but I would guess if the coral reefs are not there anymore, they would have a lot less divers coming to dive on their reefs. There's also the value of coastal protection. And what I mean by that is that when you have storms and waves coming towards the shore, uh, rather than those waves breaking on our houses um, or our schools or our malls or whatever we're developing on the coastline, um, the waves break onto the coral reef and much reduce the energy of the wave that's hitting the land. So they are giving us as humans uh, this service of coastal protection, which otherwise would, would cost us millions uh, to invest in protecting our shorelines. Because people like to live on the coast. Also nutrition, um, something like a billion people will get uh, some part of their nutrition from uh, coral reef fish. Um, but also the fact that uh, coral reefs also act as a nursery for young juvenile fish when they are small, um, which once they grow up will become bigger fish and perhaps move out into the ocean, oceanic uh, regions and become part of a commercial fishery. So whether we're talking about large scale commercial fisheries or small artisanal fisheries, um, reefs have a really important value um, for nutrition and protein source for, for many, many people in the world. And also cultural value. Um, a lot of uh, local communities will have real spiritual connection or religious connection to their reefs. And that's another important reason and another valid reason to, to appreciate them. Also medicine. There are many bioproducts or even inspiration for medicines that the reefs uh, give us. Uh, and I think this is probably something that's going to continue to take off. It's quite an untapped resource, I would say, at the moment. Um, but medicine's definitely got some potential. Primary production. Uh, what I mean by that is, again, going back to the idea of the importance of the algae. So we know often when we see these 
pictures of we go diving on coral reefs, we really appreciate the blue, clear water. Um, but that blue, clear water signifies that there is very little nutrients available in that water. And what primary production is, is again, the idea of the grass or the trees in your garden or those little algae inside the coral. They are the first step in the food chain. They are the ones that take the sun to energy and kick off the rest of the food chain, um, which enables the corals to grow, which enables the fish to live in the corals and the bigger fish to eat the little fish and so on up to the sharks. Um, so primary production. Um, otherwise, these sort of blue water reef areas might not have almost anything living in it. And finally, I just think the biodiversity of coral reefs is something that is important and to uh, appreciate. Uh, the coral diversity, so diversity essentially means the number of species that exist there, the number of species that live there. And coral reefs have a, a number of species that is only comparable perhaps to the, the, the rainforests on the land. However, Climate change is severely affecting our coral reefs. And when I'm talking about climate change with coral reefs, for me, the main threat um, and, and for most uh, coral reef climate scientists, we, we agree that the biggest threat is rising temperatures. Um, as seawater temperatures rise, um, and particularly over the last 30 years, we've lost something like 50% of the world's coral reefs to, to temperature um, stress. And I just want to take uh, a little side detour that um, in case uh, if, I don't know how much this is coming up in the British news, uh, not to be honest, up to date with most British news. Uh, this is now going on in Glasgow. This is the UN Climate Change Conference. There were also massive protests, I think, over the weekend um, and throughout the week. Um, and this is the time when many politicians from all around the world uh, get together and they decide on what commitments, um, what what uh, goals they are committed to in order to tackle and mitigate climate change, but also um, adaptation processes. Um, so if you can uh, follow any of this on various social media outlets or news outlets, um, I would recommend watching a few of the speeches, um, particularly from some of the indigenous uh, populations um, but also David Attenborough gave a really great, great talk, um, less so Boris Johnson, but uh, I, there, are, there are many, many good, good recorded videos that are already available on YouTube. So check it out. So back to coral reefs. Uh, why do we care about climate change when we're talking about coral reefs? Um, and I think this figure uh, all these photos illustrates it quite nicely. Um, on the first panel, you have a healthy coral reef, and we can tell it's healthy because of this brown color that the corals have. And remember, the brown means that it's full of these algae. It's a happy, healthy coral reef. Um, what happened in this is the summer, southern hemisphere um, uh, summertime for them in 2014. Um, is that there was a really uh, abnormally high uh, water temperature period. And what that means for coral reefs uh, around the world is that it causes the, the relationship between the algae and the, and the coral animal to become very, very stressed. And essentially, the algae are forced to leave their coral home. And the reason that's important is, again, remember that we said that something like some corals can get 100% of their energy from these algae. So as soon as you take away the algae, imagine taking away 70 to 100% of our diets, we'd be starving. We'd be incredibly hungry. We'd lose a lot of weight. Um, and that's what's happening here in the middle picture. The coral animal is still alive, but it's starving. Um, I can tell it's alive because of this bright white color, and that's where it gets the name coral bleaching. So what this is, is a stage where the algae is left, but you can see through that transparent tissue uh, of the coral animal. And what you're seeing here is the white calcium carbonate skeleton uh, of the coral through the tissue. 
Um, if the conditions are not reversed, I mean that the temperature doesn't come down uh, relatively fast, and we're talking a period of weeks uh, maximum. Uh, what often happens is these corals continue to starve, they continue to lose weight, and eventually they will die. Uh, and that's what's happened in the final picture here in August 2015 on this particular reef. This reef is also a brown color, yeah, I can see, but I can also see it's kind of a fluffy brown color. It's not that bright uh, brown anymore, and that's because coral has died and other algae big macro algae, which is not helpful to the corals at all, has just totally taken over this reef. And I want you just to see also the time period on which this happens. This is a period of about eight, nine months, and we've gone from a beautiful reef to one that's totally dead and will take decades, if not more, to recover. So eight months to die, decades to uh, recover, if at all. So after all that doom and gloom, <laughs> I want to bring it back up a little bit. Um, I work in Ilat, and these are some of our reefs in Ilat. Uh, we have pretty beautiful reefs. If you've ever also been in the Red Sea, we have a similar kind of uh, diversity, similar species uh, live uh, up here in the Gulf as they do in the Red Sea. Um, and what is quite amazing is that we have never seen a mass coral bleaching event um, within, within the sea at all. So despite the fact that temperatures are rising in the Gulf of Alat faster than the global average, we have never seen a coral bleaching event. And this is kind of what we knew at the start of my PhD. Um, and so in my PhD, I took, uh, sorry, we have a cat issue. Always happens on Zoom, right? They never, they don't care about you the rest of the day, but as soon as you start talking to your computer, the cat wants to be on the computer. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so through my PhD, actually I wanted to take a lot of uh, corals and I put them into this aquarium system, which is uh, what we have in Elat. Um, and essentially it's like uh, doing a kind of a stress test on a coral. It's like putting you on a treadmill and making you run and uh, turning you up to lots of different temperatures and essentially seeing how you perform. Um, so this is what I did with corals. I did coral stress tests. Um, and what the system allows us to do is that it has uh, seawater flowing in directly from the sea. So it's very natural conditions. It's outdoors, so we get the, the natural sunlight. But what we can also do is we can turn up the temperature a bit. And that allows us to simulate how climate change might look in the future. Um, and I can tell you that most of us as PhD students are like waiting for that result uh, from our experiments that shows us that something really like significant and strong, definitive has happened and that we can go to our supervisors and we can go to the, the journals and publish something that's like a really, really strong obvious effect of something really happened in our experiments. I was just waiting for this effect to happen all the time. And what I kept getting was like null results. Like nothing has happened. Nothing is different between the present day temperatures and the temperatures that I'm pushing it to be like in 200 years time. The corals essentially didn't care that I was heating them up. Um, and, and that's kind of the conclusion of my PhD. We did it with lots of different uh, species. We did it across different life stages from the babies through the reproduction phase, which is typically quite uh, energetically sensitive and also with adults. <clears throat> and most of what I show is that the corals of the Gulf of Aqua pretty much don't care about temperature stress. Awesome. That's great news. Uh, for the corals in the Red Sea, we think that they may last a lot longer uh, than corals around the, the rest of the world. However, I'm going to do this to you again and put another but in it. Um, that's not the end of the story. Uh, when we're talking about things like climate change and temperature stress in particular, these we talk of them as global problems. So uh, things that affect, affect the whole of the earth. Um, and individual countries have very 
um, little power on their own to do something about it. But the other sort of the opposite problem to global problems are what we call local scale problems. Um, and Israel has a few of these. For example, it doesn't rain here very often at all. I was talking to, to Mark about it in the, in the beginning. Um, but when it rains, it floods. Um, that's particularly because also we don't have a great sewage system here um, and the land is very dry. So when it rains, these few millimeters it's supposed to rain each year, it really, really torrentially floods. And what you're looking at in this photograph um, is the Gulf of Aqaba. In the back, these mountains are Jordan. This city here is Aqaba. And on the side where the photograph is, uh, this is Israel and our coast. And what's happened here uh, is that it's rained and all of the water uh, has fallen or flooded through the desert and through the wadis of the desert and actually then deposited itself on top of our coral reefs. It hasn't gone through the sewage system, it's run off straight from the land. Um, so underneath this big brown sludge is a beautiful coral reef. This is actually our nature reserve, uh, some of the best re reefs that we have uh, in Ilat but it's covered by this big brown sludge. And this is just sediment and all kinds of sand uh, from, the, from the desert that's washed straight into the sea. Uh, and what this does is firstly, it's blocking the sunlight and corals need light or the algae of the corals need light in order to grow. Uh, so they can't do that anymore. Um, and also the other thing is that the sediment over a period of days, even weeks, uh, slowly settles out of the water column um, and sits essentially on top of the coral. And this is like suffocating them, uh, drowning them in sand. Um, and it takes a lot of energy for corals to remove that sand uh, from their tissues. And the other thing that happens when you have a flash flood like this is that it brings all kinds of yuck from the road and from the city that hasn't been washed off for an entire year before that. So all of the oil chemicals, metals, whatever, pesticides um, from the land washes with that water into, into the reef. Um, and what uh, another PhD student in my lab showed is that when you mix uh, these uh, particularly heavy metals with temperature stress of climate change, the corals can't deal with it anymore. Um, the corals in the Gulf of Aqaba here that I showed were resistant to just the temperature stress when you add on top of that all kinds of chemicals and metals, they just, they can't deal with it anymore. They lose that thermal tolerance and they do show bleaching, which tells us that um, management or mitigation of these local scale effects is gonna be really key uh, to enable us to keep our corals uh, into the future. Um, just briefly also, this is a, a storm which hit us in March, uh, 2020. Um, Usually our winds here, prevailing winds come from the north. And this is a storm that came up from the south. Um, it was uh, described as a one in, once in 150 year storm, um, which again, linking back to climate change is something we think is going to increase, um, definitely also in this region. And if you take a look at this photograph here, uh, what you're looking at is it's only a few days after the storm. So it's a uh, pretty murky water still. Uh, and what you're looking at these white sections, it used to be a branching coral. And what's happened is literally the storm has ripped the branches off of that coral and you're looking at bare uncovered skeleton. Um, also in this photograph, you see a brick here, you see a piece of pipe. This is like some kind of metal stick. So again, all kinds of trash from the, the city or from the beaches gets washed into the, into the sea. And not only is it ugly, but this mechanically damages the coral reefs. Um, so it's also yeah, possible that this brick, for example, is what's actually broken this coral. Um, and what happened on our reefs after this storm is that very quickly that algae cover that you saw in that three part photograph where the coral reefs start to bleach, algae grow much faster and um, and quicker than the coral can. So and any of these wounds and cuts and open tissue parts uh, that the corals would have had from the storm very quickly became overtaken by algae 
um, this photo here, this would have been here, um, a whole, uh, what we call a, a brain coral, if you've heard the term before. And you can see a tiny little bit of this brain coral still alive, this brown tissue here. The white region around it is newly dead tissue. So there's kind of like a stress, stress band here and the rest of it, the coral has already been totally uh, overtaken uh, by the algae. Again, this is the, the same storm. Um, this is a before photograph and I want you to be able to see hopefully all of this sort of texture here on the reef and all of these uh, small blocks uh, that you get on the reef. And then you compare to the after photograph, which not only is this, it's kind of a beautiful green color, but when you know you're supposed to be looking at a, a coral reef, you know that it's a yucky algae green and it should not be there. This is not what we expect our beaches to look like. But um, also again, zoom in, let's say on this region here and all of that texture has gone. The corals were literally wiped off the surface uh, of the reef uh, thanks to that storm. And I have to say it's a, it's starting to recover. That algae is definitely gone thanks to good work of the fish. Uh, but corals take a lot longer to grow. Jess, can I jump in with a question that someone's asked? Yeah, go for it. Okay, so I'm just going to read it as they typed it. It says, fantastic work your team is doing. Uh, with the heat-resistant coral species you found, are these species localised to the Gulf of Aqaba, or is this resistance common throughout the wider Red Sea reef systems? Yeah, really great question. Um, so many of the species that we worked on do have even a sort of what we call a pan-tropical distribution, so you can find them most places in the tropics. Um, part of the reason uh, that we think that uh, they are able to withstand temperature is specific to the Red Sea. So um, I won't go completely into it unless you, unless you want me to, uh, but yeah, it's, the resistance is specific to the Red Sea and even more specifically, um, I think your question was asking if we can find it uh, also in the Red Sea or, or just the Gulf of Aqaba. And we think it, it, this resistance is spreading to something around sort of halfway in Egypt. So around Haggadah, this kind of uh, latitude and more north, we do see pretty good resistance. Um, but there has been some coral bleaching in the south of Egypt, for example. Um, so that's kind of roughly the latitude that I, I would say it spreads to. So all of the Gulf of Aqaba and the northern part of the Red Sea but it doesn't apply um, anymore to the south of the Red Sea. It's too hot. It's already breached, uh, breached those thresholds. I hope that answers uh, the question. A, a second question, I think, related. Uh, so you, you've talked about the temperature resistant, but what about the impacts of dissolved uh, CO2 and the increased acidity impacting the reef building capacity of the hard corals? Yeah, uh, great knowledge. Um, so for those of you who don't know, um, CO2 or uptake by the oceans is causing the, the pH of the ocean to decrease. Uh, we call this ocean acidification. Um, there is a lot of, of great research on it. Um, and I included it also in my PhD uh, research. I didn't include it here because I saw much, um, much less less Im implications of it and and most of the research now in the around the world is actually showing that temperature is definitely the bigger stressor um ocean acidification does change um for example the microstructure of the corals and how this how the skeleton is deposited um it can cause the skeleton for example to become more porous which means it's more it's weaker it's more fragile um so things like storms will, will uh, more severely affect corals breaking. Um, but the thing with ocean acidification is also that the, the sort of magnitude of change that we need to influence the coral reefs is much greater um, than, what, uh, than the amount of change that we need uh, in terms of temperature. So 
temperature stress is something that's already affecting corals since sort of 30, even 50 years ago. Um, whereas ocean acidification is something more of like a, what we see as like a hundred year kind of problem. So I have to say that a lot of the focus is becoming definitely more on, on temperature stress. Um, that's the more immediate or urgent issue. Okay. Uh, and a follow on, uh, do you think the elevated nutrient levels contribute to the predominance of the algae, which move in after damage? Yeah, totally. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, I think probably a lot of nutrients come in off the land when we have a storm or a flood, but also uh, when you have a storm, there is a lot more mixing up of the deep water um, and the deep water tends to hold a lot of nutrients and that nutrients is brought to the surface where you have a lot more sunlight and then all the algae go, oh, fantastic. And uh, they, they definitely uh, bloom. Yeah, you're totally right. It's um, most certainly, most likely um, uh, an effect of the nutrients following storms. Totally right. Uh, and finally, have you seen any threat from microplastics to corals on your reefs? <laughs> Yeah, so we do have a little bit of research that's going on in microplastics. Um, for example, can the corals even ingest microplastics or uh, how do the chemicals that are on plastics affect, for example, the ability for coral larvae to, to settle? Uh, that's really new research and um, there's some exciting stuff uh, coming out of it. Exciting maybe is the wrong word because there, there are some negative impacts. Um, from uh, like just a visual uh, or personal point of view, yeah, when we go diving, when we go snorkeling, there is a lot of plastic in the water. Um, and that results from the fact that we live close to a big city that uh, has a growing population and it's very uh, touristic city. Um, even though we managed a few years ago to campaign to to not have plastic straws and not have plastic cups, I believe, on the beach, on on, the, on places that sell uh, drinks on the beach. Um, but still, there is a huge amount of plastic in our water. And what plastic does is it's not just ugly to look at and fish eat it, but also, for example, it can become tangled in the corals and this also then causes wounds which causes algae to be able to get in or other diseases to be able to get in and yeah totally plastics is a is a big problem all around the world uh, back to you then jess that's the end of the questions for the moment thank you okay and uh, go on um i just wanted to show this kind of really sad final uh, impact of the storm. Um, this is the before photograph is our coral nursery. Um, this is the place where we grow corals for our experiments um, and maintain the corals so that we don't necessarily always need to take corals from the natural reef. Um, so we are growing them here for the purpose of, of experiments. It's like a series of, of tables um, kind of crossing different depths um, and this one was at about uh, five meters and then if you look at the after photographs again only a few days after the storm so the visibility is really poor um, our coral nursery was totally trashed and this is down at now about 20 25 meters on the reef slope it just tumbled down the metal bars were literally bent and ripped out of the sediment all the corals lost from it all our experiments um lost in some cases years worth of experiments ongoing experiments just trashed uh overnight um and also this storm came just five days before our national lockdown for corona so the recovery efforts or the cleanup efforts took like were essentially non-existent for for a few months till we got out of lockdown um but i'm happy to say that this trash coral nursery is now removed from the sea and we have a new one uh, in place but it does take time for for these things to become established so whilst we plant a few new corals on our new coral nursery uh, it takes time for the fish to come back and to realize that oh okay this, this could be a cool home and of course few uh, students uh, lost um, very important masters or phd projects um, in this storm 
yeah, there's not much you can do about it. That that was a, a part of a dis destructive part of nature. Um, so all of these last few effects that we've been talking about mostly affect the shadow reefs. So when we're talking about um, sea level uh, temperature, sorry, sea temperature increase, that happens fastest in the shallow water. And also the, the variation um, of temperature is greater in the sea surface um, compared to the deeper reefs. With the floods, a lot of that sediment and flood water first settles on the shallow reef flat and not so much of it gets down into the deeper reef. And with the storms coming onto the reef, absolutely, you can see with our own eyes, I don't know if there's been any research on it yet, but what I see with my own eyes is that there was a huge amount of damage around two to three meters deep, almost no corals left in some places. And already by five or eight meters deep, there was a lot less damage. Um, and the only sign, let's say, of the storm on the deeper reefs was that perhaps things fell down the slope from above um, and landed on corals and it maybe caused some damage. Um, so there is this idea which actually first came around um, in about the 90s that perhaps the deeper reefs can act as a refuge. Uh, from all of these disturbances or human-induced disturbances that we have on the shadow reefs. So just to define this a little bit better, deep reefs uh, for us is anything more than 30 meters deep. Um, this is partly because it's the recreational dive limit for, for Paddy and many um, uh, scientific diving uh, organizations around the world, but also because it's um, something to do with the physics of the light, that there's much less light generally beyond 30 meters. And by refuge, um, I mean this in the same way that uh, as humans, we seek refuge from disturbances, um, perhaps until the conditions improve and we can go back to our original homes. Um, so the idea of deep reefs as a, as a refuge um, is either that these corals in the deep reef will survive longer than the ones in the shallows until as humans, we can kind of sort our stuff out with climate change. And then perhaps the potential that the, the deep reefs can reseed or replant the, the shallow reefs uh, that were so heavily disturbed. Um, and that's really where my postdoc is taking me now, um, which is really cool. Mostly again, because I get to spend a lot of time in the water, I'm super lucky. Uh, now to work uh, with a really great team, really great supervisor that also loves diving just as much as I do. Um, and just to illustrate something that we do, let's take uh, this this picture up here. This is uh, our team. And this is all the gear that it takes for us to get down. This is just a 45 meter dive. Um, and this is me on the shallow team that day standing next to them to compare. This is all we need for our shallow team is this one single 10 liter tank compared to all of this stuff that the deeper divers need to take. So these are on uh, closed circuit with breathers is how, is how we're now doing uh, most of this work. Um, and again, we're taking a, uh, an approach where we're looking at the reproduction or the early life history stages. And the way actually that we collect coral larvae is to go into the water in the evening towards sunset with a bunch of these nets. So that you can see this is before the dive. Um, and we place these nets uh, on the reef. So this is 45 meters depth. Inside this net is one uh, adult coral colony. We place the net over the corals. Uh, and overnight, the coral should release some larvae. Uh, they float up through the net, through the funnel, and we should come back the next morning at sunrise um, and hope to find lots of baby coral larvae uh, in our nets. Um, and although these depths necessarily are not so great, uh, rebreathers are really great for us as uh, scientific divers because typically we have work to do underwater. So it's not just that 
um, in a recreational sense, you, you want to explore a reef or you want to explore a wreck. We really have specific work that we need to do underwater. And firstly, it's more difficult when you rush things. So we breathers give us time. Um, and also just the gear that we would need to take or the number of tanks that we would need to take if it was open circuit, closed circuit with breathers obviously reduce the weight and all of that extra baggage that we need to take. So the best depth range for us in using with breathers is something between like 30 and 45 meters. It really extends the time um, and lessens the decompression time that we need to do. Um, and going back to the larvae, so one of the things we do is we collect coral larvae on shallow reefs and deep reefs. Um, and we want to compare them to understand how similar they are, if they really can, if the deep ones really can eventually come back up and live in the shallows or if they are two totally different things. And as I said in the beginning, those depth differences explain the differences between these two larvae here. So the one on the bottom, you can see that he's bigger. Um, it's also paler in color. And this one comes from the shallow reefs. And the one above it comes from deeper reefs. It's smaller, it's skinnier, and it is very, very dark in color compared to the first one. Um, so the color, again, comes from the algae that live inside the tissue. And the reason that the ones in the deep have more algae is because there's less light in the deep. So they need many more of these individual algae in order to produce the amount of energy uh, that they need. Uh, compared to the shallow ones, which have a huge amount of light and they need, therefore need less algae to produce the same amount of energy. Um, and the other thing that uh, we do is to look at how the corals in the deep are reproducing. So this, for example, is us uh, in the middle taking a fragment of an adult coral and we're looking at uh, how well this coral is reproducing. So we're looking to count and to measure its eggs and uh, compare that to the shallow ones. Um, and what we believe would be true is that the, one, the corals in the deep are reproducing less, again, as a function of the amount of energy uh, that there is available on the deeper reefs. Um, so back to the larvae, that explains why the larvae in the deep are smaller. Literally, the corals in the deep have less energy to produce babies uh, than the ones in the shallows, making them smaller. And this is not just these two larvae that look like this. This is uh, something that uh, uh, we did hundreds of measurements on hundreds of different larvae, and it's something that is pretty consistent um, also with a few other species. So we're also looking at how well they grow and how, and how they um, how how well they develop uh, under these different conditions. And that's what we do with these little chambers. We put a bunch of larvae inside. We come back at regular intervals and we look to see how many are surviving, how big they are, how well do they do photosynthesis, how many algae do they have. Um, and this helps us to understand sort of the connectivity between the deep and the shallow reefs um, and how different or how similar they may be. So as a final point, I want to raise with you uh, the idea of coral migration. So on the land, as temperatures are increasing, we know many, many species of plants and animals that are migrating, um, trying to keep up with the, the temperature change, uh, to keep up with the isotherm which they are adapted to. Uh, we see it in many trees, also butterflies, birds, um, so there was the idea that perhaps the corals can also migrate, but rather than migrating latitudinally, there's a suggestion that they can migrate deeper into the water column. And again, deeper is cooler, it's more stable. Um, so the idea has been around uh, for a couple of decades. But no one has ever found any corals doing this um, in, in real life. Um, and I'm jumping into the Mediterranean here, which is why there's a bunch of spots on the screen now and it's not such a clear, beautiful uh, Red Sea image anymore. 
Um, but this is the first project that I jumped, that I got pulled into in, in, in the start of my postdoc. This is uh, the Israeli monitoring program. This is my supervisor at 35 meters deep, uh, just off the Israeli Mediterranean coast. And this lump here, this is a, a reef building coral called Oculina patagonica. And in the Israeli Mediterranean coast, it was only ever found uh, up to around 10 meters deep. But two years ago, we started to see it at 30, 35 meters deep. And uh, this is perhaps the first species or the first evidence in the world of species migrating to the deep. And again, the Mediterranean is one of the seas that is heating at a really extreme rate. Um, and perhaps we start to see the migration of this species from the shallow reef, which is what I'm doing here, snorkeling inside a cave, we take a hammer and a chisel, literally to get bits of the coral off of the reef and take them back to the lab. Um, it requires a permit, you don't do it on your dives. <laughs> um, and we compare how well they're doing in the deep and the shallow. And this really is the same species. Um, it grows very similarly in the shallow and the deep, um, and yet it, it has migrated. And I can't say for sure that it's because of climate change, um, but nevertheless, the, the two uh, coincide with each other. Um, so that's it. I'm going to finish there and leave you with the thoughts that we do have really awesome corals in the Red Sea, beautiful reefs. I hope after Corona that all of you can get back to the Red Sea and experience them for yourselves. Um, and yet there are still many threats that we need to consider and, and and we still need to take care of this awesome reef if it's going to be able to persist into the future. That's it.